and this is the Old Town Mariposa Show, coming to you from my good friends at Bet's Gold Coin. Today I have with me Kent. Hi Kent. Hi. I'm Julie. Well, <laughs> glad to know you. Glad to meet you. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Well, <clears throat> about myself regarding the uh, airplane is that I grew up in Southern California during World War II, essentially moved there in 1942, and both my parents went to work in the aviation industry early in 42, so I grew up immersed in uh, the aviation industry, essentially, mm -hmm. and went to work in it immediately after high school. I went to work for North American Aviation Building, brand new up 100s at the time, back in 1956. Okay. Um, so... You mentioned that you uh, rebuilt a P-40B. Uh, could you tell me a little bit of a history? What is the history of this aircraft? Say again? What is the history of this aircraft? Well, this aircraft, what makes it so significant is that it is the only still existing American fighter plane that was at Pearl Harbor the morning of the attack that exists in any way, shape, or form. And it had survived the attack, but then it crashed in a training flight about two months later on a mountainside in Oahu, and the wreckage stayed buried in the jungle for 43 years before we discovered it and recovered it. And the airplane, rather than being a restoration, is actually a remanufacture. Mm -hmm. We only had about 5 to 10% of the original airplane to go in, the one that we built. So we really had to build it from scratch. Okay, so did you have some blueprints to help you build We it? had about 10% of the blueprints that we needed, and we got them from the Smithsonian Institute, actually. One of the things that was so important in recovering this particular aircraft and two others that we got from the High Sierras up here, about 60 miles due east of Fresno, was that there were no currently existing aircraft to that time that were considered extinct, period. So when we went into it, we had some material uh, that was usable, like I'd say maybe 5% out of the three airplanes that we recovered. But we really had to re-engineer all of the tooling. So it's not a restoration, it's a remanufacture, essentially. So what got you interested in remanufacturing the P-40B? Well, what interested me, you know, was that uh, I fell in love with the type of airplane during World War II when I was about six or seven years old as a result of seeing John Wayne movie about the Flying Tigers. And for people that study the history at the time, aviation history at the time, the Flying Tigers were the first defeat of the Japanese Air Force in World War II. And the airplane painted in the colors of the Flying Tigers with the shark teeth on the front became an icon in the United States. Everybody knew what the Flying Tigers were. And so that's really what <clears throat> enchanted me with that particular image. And I wanted to be a fighter pilot, but my eyes weren't good enough. So instead of flying the aircraft, I decided that I would help build them. And so that's what I did in my career. I worked at North American Aviation, Hughes Aircraft, three and a half years at Tavis Corporation, uh, which was really interesting. And then <clears throat> that was uh, kind of my career, was uh, the aerospace industry. My, my uh, union badge said I was a space technician, so I guess that's what I was. But I was mainly a machinist and, and a builder rather than an engineer. I had no formal engineering training at all, essentially, but I really soaked a lot of it up when I was working in the industry. So I was the chief builder uh, of the, this aircraft, essentially. Uh, so if you only had... 10% of the blueprints, then you had to come up with the rest of the aircraft. How did you go about that? Well, the wreckage, when a lot of people looked at the wreckage and said, what are you going to do with that heap of rubble? And that's what it looked like, was a heap of rubble. 
well, we're going to rebuild it, you know, and people would just roll their eyes and walk, yeah, right, good luck with that. You know. But what they didn't realize that there was so much usable material that was pattern material. You could take a crumpled piece of metal, straighten it out, and it would not be airworthy, but it was absolutely invaluable as pattern material. So, did you use any of the original material oh, from yeah. the wreckage? Yeah. Did you use all that was usable? Absolutely. Uh, so, what I really want to know is, um, over 40 years, technology changes, electronics change. So, when you were rebuilding it, did you use the technology and electronics from the time it was originally built? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, as when we built the airplane, most of the tooling, uh, the tools, machine tools we had, were the same type of tools that they used in building the original airplane. The, one of the ways that we stepped out of that was to use uh, computer generated blueprints. Mm -hmm. Essentially, one of the, the uh, things that you need for an airplane is called loft line data. And that's the absolute accurate mathematical shape of the airplane. And we had quite a bit of it, but we only had, mm, we didn't have enough. And so what we did was hire an engineer to go through what blueprints we had, and what pieces we had, and come up with uh, accurate loft line data using the computer. And then, of course, about two weeks after that happened, we got all of the loft line data. Somebody sent us the original blueprint. But what it taught us was what we actually needed to know. You know, we built a, a full-scale wooden mock-up of the fuselage to familiarize ourselves with the shape. And then when we got in, one of the things that I had learned in my career working at North American was how to build tooling. So I was the chief tooling builder. Not only that, I was the chief shop builder. We had a hangar donated to us by the city of Torrance, but it was just a big empty room. So the first thing we had to do was build the shop, then we had to build the tooling, then we had to build the parts on the tooling, then we had to assemble the parts. So it was a real learning process for me in a lot of ways. I, was, I had made a lot of large machine parts for the Saturn Apollo thing machine parts that were eight feet high and 25 feet long. Mm -hmm. But it was all machine stuff, so I had to actually learn how to do that earlier technique. And the, uh, the technique, the engineering technique for that airplane was basically 1934, mm -hmm. 1935, right around in there. So I had to learn how to do that. Fortunately, one of the people that was making parts for us was a really good guy who owned this small aircraft manufacturing shop. And when I first started this thing, I started on the fuselage, and I figured, well, I'm going to start on the small end of the fuselage. Station 16, about that wide and about that high. Mm -hmm. And I figured that'd be a good place to learn how to do it. So I went and talked to this guy and said, could you help me do this? And he said, well, what's it for? You know, and I told him, well, it's for a P-40. And this guy named Charlie Vega, great guy. He said, P-40 said, God, that's my favorite airplane of all time. So he said, come on in here and I'll show you how to do this. So he did. He took me and gave me a, a quick study lesson on how to make the tooling. And then he made virtually every part for the thing that I did. And he, he provided the material, never charges for a part in the thing he just... And that's what I found about the engineering people down there in Southern California, is that almost without fail, they were so helpful because it was such an interesting project. It was, it was very interesting. It sounds like it. How long did it take for um, the whole team to finish? Well, <clears throat> I started with the aircraft in 1989, and we flew it in 2007. I worked on that airplane 18 years, mm -hmm. from the start to the first flight. And the story's not over. I'm still <laughs> working on it, essentially. So I've been involved with that one particular project for 25 years now. Well, there's always more work to do on aircraft. Wow, well, they're on <laughs> their processes, you know. You don't just finish it. Oh, it, no. Nothing is ever finished when it comes to aircraft. Yeah. Um, so I would like to ask you, uh, earlier you mentioned something. <laughs> so, so what are you currently doing on, because you said the project's never finished, so what oh. are you currently 
working well, on right now? Well, there's two things. Uh, first of all, I'm working on a book on the project. Okay. And the book is about 20% mm, uh, writing and 80% photographs and documents and history. It really shows. If somebody says, well, how did you do that? I said, well, look through these 400 pages and you're going to see how we converted a heap of rubble into a flying airplane. Yeah, that's really impressive. You don't see that very often. I mean, uh, San Diego Air and Space Museum, they refurbish some of their planes, but most of their planes that come out aren't airworthy. That's right. So when you were making your plane airworthy, what kind of processes did you have to go to in order to get it approved for flight? Well, that's a good question. Uh, the project was turned over to another person 12 years into it. I stayed on as an inspector consultant and I manufactured a few bits and pieces for it. So what they, uh, the person that finished this, a guy named Matt Nightingale, and he was working out of uh, Chino, essentially Chino Airport. And that's a giant center for restoring and remanufacturing historical aircraft. And so they had a pretty good system worked out with the FAA guys. Mm -hmm. and a lot of that stuff is uh, classified as experimental. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to meet the same standards that a commercial contract would call for. It doesn't mean that you can be less careful, mm -hmm. you know, but it just means that you didn't have a lot of oversight, essentially. So it was... Um, it was just a question of learning what we were doing and training the crew and then building the airplane, essentially. It's like your statement, you just got to get on with it, you know, and you never give up. That was one of the things. There were so many people that said, you guys are never going to finish this thing. And my thought of that was, well, maybe you couldn't finish it, <laughs> but don't tell me I can't finish it or we can't finish it. And you really have to have that attitude when you're involved in, a, in an airplane or a project oh, of yeah. that nature. Of course you do. Can't give up. No, not at all. Uh, so to wrap this up, as I am being told to wrap it up right now, uh, what could you say that you took out the most from uh, the start to current on this project? Well, I, I think the biggest thing that I got out of it was meeting the people that were involved in the original uh, use and design and building of the airplane. And, the, you know, our, our basic mission was to honor the veterans. Mm -hmm. And a young Lieutenant Kenneth W. Sprankle was killed in the crash of this airplane. And I got to tell you, there was a lot of time when I was the only guy in the shop at one o'clock in the morning with my hands on the original wreckage where it's very emotional. Yeah. When you sure. feel the sacrifice that these young men did. And that was the real purpose of doing this airplane, was to make sure that these young guys that fought for us are never forgotten. So, one more quick question. Um, did you ever figure out why the plane crashed during the Oh, training? we know exactly why it crashed. We had the airport, uh, the Air Force report. Okay. It was the first flight. It was a familiarization flight. You know what a familiarization mm -hmm. flight is. First flight by young Lieutenant Sprankle. He took the airplane up to about 8,500 feet. Took it into a slow roll, and the airplane, uh, the engine stopped at the top of the slow roll, and it spun inverted. And he fell about 5,000 feet before he got the airplane right side up, but he was in mountainous area, and he didn't have it flying forward. He was still skidding heavily sideways, went into the tree, blank, gone. So it was pretty much instantaneous as far as young Lieutenant Frankel. So, yeah, we knew exactly why and how the airplane went in. That is, that is rough. That is very rough. Um, well, I, I'm so sorry to end this on such a sad note. Uh, but thank you for coming out here and talking to us. I know I learned way more than I knew previously. Well... <laughs> Thank you for having me, and thank you for being involved in uh, your career. I, I asked your dad once, what inspired her to be involved in aerospace? And he said, well, I'm not real sure. No, you told the story. I thought, ah, makes perfect sense. <laughs>
Yeah, there's a lot. And I'm just getting more and more inspired. And this, this story is definitely part of that inspiration. I mean, it's amazing taking a wreckage from that, you know, most people would look at that and be like, oh, well, that's just trash. Just throw that away. Mm -hmm. And making it so that it can actually fly. That's amazing. That, that's absolutely amazing to me. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, this is the Old Town Mariposa Show, once again, uh, brought to you by Gold Coin. And I believe this is a wrap.